Uh, hi everyone, the are already connected. We will be waiting for two more minutes, then we are going to start the, the call of com with uh, Nicole. Okay, I think we can uh, begin. Uh, welcome back again to our weekly Sao Colloquium, everyone. And today we are happy to host uh, Nicole Thomas. She is a PhD student at UWC, and she will be talking about uh, the radio galaxy population in the Simba uh, simulation. Uh, over to you, uh, Nicole. Thank you so much. Um... And thank you for that introduction. Uh, and also thank you to the organizers for hosting me today. Uh, so as I said, I'm Nicole, I'm a PhD student. Uh, today I'll be talking a little bit about the work that I've been doing throughout my PhD, um, specifically trying to reproduce a population of radio galaxies using the symbol simulations. Um, this work is done primarily um, in um, collaboration with, of course, my supervisor, Remil Dave, um, but as well with uh, Matt Chavez from the University of Oxford and Daniel Anglet Algaza from the Center for Computational Astrophysics um, in New York and the University of Connecticut. Um, so just an overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll just give some background and motivation as to why this is important. Um, I'll introduce the Simba simulations and essentially how we go about defining radio galaxies in Simba, and then some of the results that we've gotten from this. Um, this work is based off of a publication that you can find in this archive number. Um, and yeah, I'll dive right in uh, with a statement that I think most um, people who uh, study supermassive black holes start with, and that is that uh, there is a supermassive black hole at the center of most galaxies. Um, and for their small size in comparison to their host galaxies, these supermassive black holes have an influence on the properties of the host galaxy, as well as the content of the host galaxy has an influence on the growth of the black hole. So these supermassive black holes play a significant role in how galaxies evolve and vice versa, uh, which suggests that there is this black hole galaxy co-evolution. And this has been studied throughout many decades. Um, it was initially thought that the supermassive black hole uh, co-evolves with the bulge of galaxies. And this can be seen on the left side. Uh, these are studies by Hibbert in 2000 and Cormandy and Ho uh, that did a review in 2013, which shows a very tight correlation between the, bul uh, sorry, the black hole mass and the bulge luminosity and uh, velocity dispersion within the bulge. Uh, so that tells us that black holes evolve with the galactic bulge. Uh, in addition, um, it was then also found by Reins and Voluntary in 2015, uh, as well as Chen in 2013, that there is a relationship between the black hole mass uh, and the stellar mass of the galaxy, although this relation is not quite as tight, uh, but also that the star formation of a galaxy relates to the accretion rate of the supermassive black hole. So this tells us that black holes evolve with the growth or formation of stars. Um, we can then take this further to the point where when these supermassive black holes are creating, um, they become these 
incredibly powerful radiators and they are then defined as active galactic nuclei. Um, and these active galactic nuclei are thought to be quite a key player in how um, massive galaxies quench. Uh, but you can define AGN in various ways, and this all depends on the wavelength that you're observing at, um, as well as the inclination of the AGN, whether it's along the line of sight, whether it's face on, um, et cetera. Uh, so this makes it very important to study these objects across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, otherwise, these AGN can be defined um, into two general categories. Uh, so that would be uh, radiative mode AGN or jet mode AGN. Um, and the important part about this is that these radiative mode AGN are able to form a stable accretion disk that's surrounded by this dusty obscuring structure. Uh, some of them have these radio jets, which we'll get to later on. Um, and then the jet mode AGN are inefficient in the accretion, so they cannot form the stable accretion disk. Um, and they have uh, the radiation dominated by these kinetic um, radio jets that we observe with radio telescopes. So if we were to observe these two um, modes of AGN with uh, radio telescopes, they can also be defined as high and low radio excitation galax radio galaxies. Um, so HERGs or LURGs. Um, and what we know about these um, HERGs and LURGs are the following. So they are identified by the presence of high excitation lines in the optical spectra. Um, for HERGs, they are typically hosted by galaxies that are fairly large, but still have some ongoing star formation. The supermassive black hole at the center is moderate to massive. Um, they are radiatively efficient, um, according to observations so far, um, with Eddington rates of about 1% and more. Um, and they are thought to accrete via a geometrically thin, optically thick disk of cold gas. Uh, LURGs, on the other hand, lack these uh, high excitation lines. Uh, and they are typically hosted by the most massive elliptical galaxies that have no, very little to no star formation. Um, and they have massive black holes and they are inefficient in how they accrete. So they have Eddington fractions of less than 1%. And they accrete via this advection dominated hot gas. Um, and I want to point out these last two points specifically because this will be really the, the key for the ongoing study um, ahead. Uh, so the problem with uh, AGN is that we don't know how these supermassive black holes go very well. It's not very well defined. Um, and how they influence their host galaxies is also perhaps not very well defined. So our goal is to use the SIMBA simulations to study how supermassive black holes and their host galaxies co-evolve and to test the idea that these radio galaxies are fueled by different accretion modes. Um, so we want to define a population of radio galaxies and constrain the mechanisms that drive their growth as well as how the, um, the feedback process is. Uh, and hopefully we can then make some predictions for upcoming radio surveys. Uh, so just to focus on SIMBA for a moment. So uh, you can find the, the main uh, paper under the VAE et al 2019 by this archive number here. So SIMBA is the successor to uh, the MUFASA simulation. So these are cosmological scale hydrodynamic simulations. So that just means large scale with um, gas uh, fluid uh, dynamics as well. Uh, so in SIMBA, galaxies are seeded with a 10 to the 4 solar mass black hole. Uh, this is roughly at a stellar mass of 10 to the 9 solar masses. Um, and then they create via this two-mode uh, sub-resolution prescription uh, that is um, Bondi accretion from hot gas and gravitational torque limited accretion from cold gas. And the total accretion is essentially the sum of the two. Um, and SIMBA also includes physically motivated AGN feedback, which uh, is in accordance with observations. Uh, and finally, they, it also includes um, X-ray heating in addition to the, the jet feedback and AGN winds that it includes. Uh, for the fiducial run and the simulations that we'll be um, discussing uh, in these results are a 100 um, megaparsec squared uh, cubed um, simulation with uh, 1024 cube dark matter particles and 1024 cube gas particles that are evolved into stars. 
uh, and it also outputs about 250, sorry, 151 uh, snapshots out to reach of 249. Um, and the image on the right essentially shows us the impact of the, or the importance of the, um, the AGM feedback in reproducing the observed um, galaxy stellar mass function. Um, so this is from reach of two all the way to reach of zero. Um, the lines show the green line is the full Simba physics simulation. The red line is that without any X-ray feedback, the blue line is without any jet feedback. And it really shows how important it is to include this feedback to produce the observed, which is these uh, blue points, um, yeah, to reproduce the, the observed um, oopsie, um, galaxy stellar mass function. Um, so specifically to focus on the occasion mode, which is really important for this talk, is that Simba accretes, as I mentioned before, in two modes using Bondi accretion from hot gas and is the first simulation to incorporate this gravitational torque limited accretion from cold gas, which essentially accounts for instabilities in the galactic disk that drives cold gas towards the center of the galaxy, where it can then be accreted onto the supermassive black hole, um, as well as also going to star formation. And what's very cool about this is that it, um, it reproduces the uh, black hole mass velocity dispersion relation without any um, changes to or any significant boosting or changes you need to make for simulations that just use Bondi accretion. So often what happens is the black holes will grow too much and you need to suppress that growth. Um, so the gravitational torque limit accretion is um, really, um, I think, exciting in that you don't need to um, provide any suppression to the growth of the black holes. They go along the uh, black hole mass velocity dispersion relation. Um, and it also shows us that, or the, this model also um, shows us that the relationship between black hole growth and star formation growth is related. Uh, and this can be seen by the star formation density um, over cosmic time. Um, multiplied by some factor. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's the first simulation to do this, which is incredible. Uh, and more details on this model can be seen in various uh, Angulus Alcazar papers. Um, I will add some uh, archive numbers at the end. Uh, finally, for Simba, the AGN feedback includes AGN winds, um, as well as jets for black holes that are larger than 10 to the seven and a half solar masses. Uh, and these jets are turned on at Eddington fractions of about 20% and increase with decreasing Eddington fraction, uh, which can be seen um, in this relation. Uh, and then for galaxies that have their full velocity jets and gas fractions of less than 20%, um, we add an additional X-ray heating. And on the right here is a very nice uh, schematic that shows how these jets uh, increase the temperature of the intergalactic medium. So this is again, which is two, one and zero um, within the, the Simba simulation. And this is with jets on the left side and right is without jets. And you really see that by reach of zero, um, the jets really do heat up the, um, the intergalactic medium quite um, efficiently. Uh, so how do we, get to the good stuff. So uh, we define radio galaxies in Simba as those that have full velocity jets, uh, but we also want to make sure that we are in accordance with observations. So we specifically identify galaxies in Simba that have stellar uh, masses larger than, larger than 10 to the nine and a half solar masses, uh, as well as black hole masses larger than 10 to the eight solar masses. We want to make sure that they have full velocity jets, so they need to have Eddington fractions of less than uh, 2%, but not zero, because they need to be accreting to be considered a radio galaxy. If you hear some noise in my background, I apologize. I think we have some window washers, um, so please just ignore that. Um, so sorry, just to go back. So that gives us about 1,365 galaxies. Uh, we then identify whether a galaxy is a Herg or a Lurg, depending on the dominant mode of accretion. So for Hergs, these are radio galaxies that are dominated by torque limited accretion, uh, which is then analogous to, uh, as I mentioned before, the, um, the accretion from a cold optically thick disk that um, we see in observations. And then Lurgs are dominated by Bondi accretion. So 
the when I say dominated, I mean that the the fraction of their total location must be more than 50% in uh, those modes, and we average this over 50 mega years just to reduce um, stochasticity in the occasion rates of these supermass black holes. Uh, we then model the um, radio luminosity coming from these radio galaxies um, according to for star formation, according to Condor 1992, where you have a thermal and non thermal contribution. We then add the two for the star forming um, emission. So this is applied to all galaxies, not only radio galaxies. Um, and then for AGN specifically, we follow according to Jesse and Freda in 2008 for low luminosity galaxies, uh, sorry, low luminosity AGN. Um, and because of the, the small volume in Simba, we do not really reproduce these very high luminosity quasar-like objects. So to account for that, we add an additional contribution to the hosts that live in the largest dark matter halos. Um, and just give them an extra lobe-like um, emission. Uh, so this results in the following. So we can study the radio luminosity function um, at local times. Uh, so the image that you see here is exactly that, the radio luminosity function from Simba in comparison to observations. Um, so just to go through this as quick as I can. Um, so the blue dashed line is the star forming emission uh, within Simba. The red dashed line is the AGN emission from Simba. Um, and this green line, which is a bit more difficult to see, but with the green band for the one sigma errors is the total radio luminosity function from Simba. Uh, and then the black line is the total observed radio luminosity function. Um, the blue or cyan um, solid line is the star forming, and the red is the AGN um, observed radio luminosity functions. Uh, and what we see is that um, I'm going to focus, actually, no, let me just mention the right hand side before I continue. Um, on the right hand side, what we can also do is we can compare the emission that comes from specifically star forming galaxies and quiescent galaxies in Simba and see how they compare to the radio luminosity functions for AGN and star formation. Uh, so this is shown by the blue dashed line as star forming galaxies in Simba. And then the um, magenta line dashed line is the of quiescent galaxies in Simba. Uh, so just to look at the left side first, we see that Simba reproduces the radio luminosity function fairly well at all luminosities specifically probed in Simba. So that's from about uh, 10 to the 20 um, watts per hertz up to about 10 to the 25. Uh, and we see that AGN's uh, emission really starts to dominate the radio luminosity function at about, uh, what's that, 10 to the 22 and a half um, watts per hertz. If we then look at the star forming galaxies and quiescent galaxies and see how they uh, trace the radio luminosity function, what we find is perhaps not so surprisingly, but that star formation really is the driver of radio power or radio emission in star forming galaxies. And the quiescent galaxies really trace the AG and radio luminosity function fairly well. So, what we can say from that is that. AGN, um, sorry, it's very loud outside. Um, AGN um, occasion is really the driver of radio power in quiescent galaxies. Uh, so what's really exciting about this is that we can hopefully, or be quite hopeful that Simba can roughly reproduce the basic radio galaxy demographics. Uh, but we're here to also talk about specifically radio galaxies. So we can also divide the radio luminosity function between Hergs and Lergs. Um, so on the left hand side, we have Hergs, um, again represented by the cyan dotted lines with Erebos, which is from Simba. This is then in um, comparison to observations by Bess and Heckman in 2012. This is their Lergs, the blue dashed line. Um, and then just for um, reference, we have the AGN line from Martin Sadler again, uh, as well as the AGN total AGN line from Bess and Heckman 2012 by these uh, little black squares. 
The dashed line that you see here is essentially the minimum number density that we can probe with Simba. Um, and then again, on the right side, we have the lurks, which are these red dotted lines of error bars. We can also uh, split these two populations into whether their hosts are staff or main and quiescent as well and see how they contribute to the radioluminosity function. So for star forming, we have the, which might be very difficult to see on this side, so I'll point it out on this side. So star forming would be these light blue dot dashed lines, and then the quiescent would be these dotted um, magenta lines that you see in the background. Um, okay, so to start off with hugs, we see that at higher luminosities, the hugs are slightly overpredicted. Um, but these are still within the one sigma error bars. Again, we cannot probe below this line. Um, so that also influences the results. Uh, and we see that really for HERGS, the star forming galaxies are what dominates the, the radio luminosity for HERGS. Um, specific, and then to move on to LURGS, we see that LURGS are fairly well produced, uh, reproduced at the higher luminosity end with a slight drop off at the low luminosity end and are primarily uh, dominated by the quiescent population. Um, also, we can note that the LURGS really do dominate the radio luminosity function uh, at the luminosity is probed in Simba. Uh, we can then ask the question, okay, so if I see I look up at the night sky and I see one hug and one lug. What is the difference between their host properties? Uh, so we can do this by studying the full radio galaxy population in Simba. Um, so the various plots you see here are how each property uh, evolves with radio luminosity. So specifically uh, on the top left, we have stellar mass. Top right, we have black hole mass. Uh, bottom left, we have halo mass. I mean, bottom right, we have specific star formation date. Uh, and what's really interesting about these plots is that, um, oh, sorry, just to mention, of course, the little red points are those of LURGS and the little cyan classes are that of HERGS. Uh, and then these orange and blue points with error bars are the median global uh, properties uh, for LURGS and HERGS respectively. Uh, so what's really interesting at the, uh, about this is that for your stellar mass, your black hole mass, your halo mass, there isn't a lot of difference between the median properties um, between HERGS and LERGS, which is quite um, different to what is expected from observations. Um, however, we do note that SIMBA does probe lower masses um, than what has been observed. So if we were to focus perhaps, say, on the the most large um, galaxies that we would see that these are typically your, your lurgs um, that you would expect to see there. Uh, but what is also interesting is that if we look at the specific star formation rates, we see that at these higher luminosities, there are these um, HERGs at much higher specific star formation rates than that of the lurgs. So HERGs definitely have um, much more star formation than the lurgs. Um, but as we go down to lower luminosities, we see that it's actually very difficult to tell the difference between them. Uh, so this is an interesting prediction that Simba makes in that uh, once we have observations that will observe these lower luminosities, uh, we might see much more overlap between, um, at least in star formation for high and low excitation radio galaxies. Um, Another question we can ask is, okay, so we've now compared the two to each other, but what about in comparison to normal galaxies that are not um, these jet mode AGN? Uh, so what we can do is we can compare each group, so each um, set of HERGs and LURGs to a normal galaxy population specifically matched in their stellar mass. Um, so for example, in this image you see here is the number distribution of HERGS and LURGS uh, and we match so the cyan line again is HERGS and the uh, red line again is LURGS and then the light gray uh, histogram is how we match uh, normal galaxies to the HERG uh, distribution and then the black line is that for, for LURGS as well 
Um, also, what is important to note is that the most massive galaxies are lurks. So we don't actually have enough normal galaxies to compare to at these higher masses. So we just um, keep those aside and compare those um, separately. Uh, and what is also important to note is that these normal galaxies do not include any radio galaxies. Um, and they are also matched in the sense that they need to host a black hole of mass larger than 10 to the 6 as well. So that means they have grown the supermassive black hole enough to reach the um, black hole mass uh, velocity dispersion relation. So we can do this for all of the properties I've mentioned before, including one or two others. I'm not going to go through the um, entire plot that you see on the right. So those are just the fractional distributions. Um, but I will just conclude what we find from, um, from these plots. And that is, if we compare LURGS um, with a sample matched by its stellar mass, we find that these LURGS really extend to much higher black hole masses. Um, they also have a surprisingly very similar distribution of the uh, stellar velocity dispersions. They are hosted by the largest halos, uh, which might be also due to the fact um, that you have this uh, halo mass stellar mass relation. So that could be what it's due to. So since LURGS are the largest objects, they would probably exist in the largest halos for the exact um, same reason. Uh, if we look at their specific star formation rates, the LURGS surprisingly also uh, extend into the Green Valley. Uh, the median specific star formation rate is surprisingly higher than the matched sample. Um, but we also consider that some galaxies might have uh, zero uh, specific star formation rate as well, and that is included in this um, non-radio galaxy sample. Um, however, the LURGs do not span the highest uh, specific star formation rates where you might find some normal galaxies as well. And of course, they have lower Eddington fractions, which uh, comes from the definition of these radio galaxies and that they need to have Eddington fractions less than 2%. Uh, if we focus on the HERGs and compare that with the match sample, we find that HERGs are very similar in their distributions of black hole mass, velocity dispersion, and halo mass. And they also span the full range of specific star formation dates, and, but have a higher a specific star formation rate median. Uh, and again, they have lower Eddington fractions, again, because of how radio galaxies are defined. And then if we compare HERGS with LURGS, again, um, LURGS have higher black hole masses, halo masses, and uh, velocity dispersions, which is expected. They also have lower specific star formation rates, which we've seen before. But what is Especially uh, interesting here is that HERGS and LURGS have very similar agent infractions. And if you recall uh, from what I said at the beginning about observations is that we actually see this very strong dichotomy between the Eddington rates of HERGS and LURGS, specifically that uh, LURGS should have higher uh, Eddington fractions and LURGS lower. Uh, but we'll keep that in mind for now. Um, and also we can then study how this radio um, population evolves over cosmic time. Uh, so the plot on the left, sorry, right, um, shows the evolution of the radio luminosity function from rate of three to rate of 0.25, because we've already looked at the local um, radio luminosity function. And what is um, what we do here is we compare to observations by small g h l, sorry, et al. Um, by these little black boxes, with error bars, and then again in comparison to March and Sadler um, for reference uh, at rate of 0.25. Um, and what we what we see really is that Simba is actually able to um, reproduce this uh, observed radio luminosity function through to high rate shift, which is quite exciting and quite um, hopeful. Uh, but what we also notice is that the star formation contribution to the radio luminosity function is what starts to dominate at these high redshifts. Uh, so while we might match the high redshift radio luminosity function, we might also have to consider how to redefine radio galaxies at these high redshifts, uh, especially at low luminosities for these high redshifts where 
um, a lot of galaxies or a lot of radio galaxies have really high star forming rates and high Eddington fractions. So in Simba, we're defining those um, radio galaxies as those that have low Eddington fractions. So we need to just think about how to tackle that specific problem. Uh, so to summarize these results so far, uh, as I mentioned before, Simba is a state-of-the-art suite of cosmological simulations uh, that has this unique uh, two-mode growth and feedback prescription for supermassive black holes, and really provides a unique platform to explore how galaxies evolve with their supermassive black holes. Uh, Simba is able to produce a population of radio galaxies that can be separated into hugs and loves, which is also something that's not been done before, which is quite exciting. Uh, and this is then based on the dominant mode of accretion. Um, and these populations also do match observed radio luminosity functions and other properties. Um, for these large scale properties or these global properties, uh, we find that Hertz and Lurgs are actually fairly similar uh, in that, um, sorry, they, they're similar to the properties found in observations of specifically um, Lurgs are hosted by this large stellar mass, black hole mass, stellar velocity dispersion and quiescent galaxies compared to that of Hergs, but they're very similar in the Eddington fraction. So this dichotomy that has been seen before in observations is not quite as strong as what we see in Simba. So Simba predicts that with deeper, more sensitive observations, we'll really start seeing this increasing overlap between the two populations, uh, which is also very quite exciting. Um, just for the next few minutes, I'll just very briefly talk about what we're working on at the moment. Um, so one of the other questions really is how these AGN, um, what, it, what the relationship between these AGN and the environments are. So typically from observations, we expect AGN um, or the, the brightest cluster galaxy in a group or cluster or halo to be um, a radio galaxy, so that would specifically be the, the central galaxy in a cluster. And the role of this AGN within the cluster is to essentially heat up the surrounding gas in the intercluster medium and really disrupt the cooling um, of the center of the cluster. Um, and it is thought that potentially the supermassive black hole at the center of the radio galaxy then is fueled by the hot intercluster medium gas. Uh, these relationships can be studied using various X-ray properties, um, specifically the X-ray um, luminosity, radio luminosity relation really describes uh, that there is this um, tight correlation between the, the size or the temperature of a cluster and the central um, AGN. Uh, but what's quite interesting is that in Simba, we find that about 20% uh, of radio galaxies are actually satellite galaxies, so not your BCG or central galaxy. Uh, this is compared to about 33% for all galaxies in Simba and 31% for all galaxies with uh, stellar masses larger than 10 to 9 and a half solar masses. So although radio galaxies typically avoid being satellites. So it's a very small uh, percentage, but it's still significant um, enough to say that they are not always the, the central um, galaxy, uh, but they're also not dramatically avoid of satellites. Uh, this is actually in agreement with a lot of more recent observations, um, specifically um, 2021. And I think there was a, um, I, I do see James Ed is online, so I don't want to say this incorrectly, <laughs> uh, but I think um, there was also a study by Ed and um, uh, someone else, I can't remember the other authors, I apologize, um, that showed that these radio galaxies or these AGN can be satellite galaxies as well. Um, and if we look at the difference between whether they're satellite or central, we actually find that there isn't a lot of difference between the two uh, populations. So when I say two populations, I mean whether they're central or satellite. Um, we might see that for, for HUGS, uh, some of the satellites might have very slightly lower luminosities um, and lower Eddington fractions, which uh, will not show right now. Uh, but this could be due to the fact that if you're a satellite galaxy, you're most likely in a more 
a populated um, group or cluster compared to that of a central. Um, you could be the only galaxy if you're a central. Um, but essentially, this would mean that there might be less cold gas. So according to how Hergs are defined, so less cold gas to actually accrete, and therefore you would have lower luminosities and lower eddies interactions. Um, another thing we can look at is the environment of these um, these populations as well. Again, I'm not going to go through this too much because there's a lot going on uh, uh, in these plots, but we can essentially study how um, galaxies, uh, the environment of galaxies as a function of their stellar mass, black hole mass, radio luminosity and eddy interaction. Uh, and just to summarize what these plots show is that herbs typically reside in under dense environments and actually very much trace these star forming um, sort of environments, uh, star forming galaxy environments. Uh, whereas LURGs will, uh, because they are also the most massive objects, they the lurk that high masses would live in very um, more dense environments as well. Um, and if we compare these with um, for the radio luminosities and any interactions, we actually see very little dependence on the um, on these properties as to whether they would live in more dense or under dense environments. Um, which is also really interesting uh, because one of the things that observations predict is that, or perhaps not predict, but show is that uh, at low luminosities, there isn't a dependence on um, for the environments of these populations uh, and that you would only see this come into play at really high luminosities. And as I've shown before, Simba does not reproduce very high luminosity uh, radio galaxies. So for the uh, luminosities probed in Simba, we can say that there is no strong dependence on the radio luminosity. Uh, and what finally, what else we can show is that the environment density scales most strongly with black hole mass rather than the stellar mass, uh, which could be a, actually a bias tracer of the, the density uh, of the environment. So that is quite interesting as well. And then finally, just to mention uh, some of the uh, predictions or upcoming um, plans we have to, with these um, results, uh, that is to work quite closely with MITE. So I'm sure everyone knows that MITE is a pre, um, one of the surveys on Meerkat, which is a precursor to the SKA. And it has a primary science goal of studying the growth and feedback of supermassive black holes, um, as well as Sarva mentioned through to cosmic moon and beyond. Um, and the only thing that I really want to mention with this is that MITE has now recently started um, uh, doing science. <laughs> um, and I don't know if anyone in the audience was at uh, the SKA conference earlier this year, but Imogen Whitham gave a talk uh, on some of the results, specifically on radio galaxies. And her preliminary results showed that the dichotomy between Hergs and Lurgs are also much um, less defined as what was uh, previously observed. So that is a very exciting result. And so we'll be, we'll really be working quite closely with these results to do a more closer comparison uh, with Imogen and the MIT team um, as soon as those um, results are ready. Other future plans we have is to use high resolution low far observations as well as Eagle simulations to compare um, various um, models of accretion and feedback to see which really uh, works much better and which uh, constrains the, the evolution of supermassive black holes and radio galaxies and, um, specifically. Uh, we also want to compare various prescriptions or models for radio emission. Um, so that it has always been quite tricky because um, most of the cosmological bar one or two um, simulations do not account for magnetic fields. So um, understanding the emission due to synchrotron is uh, a bit difficult in that regard. Uh, so there are a few semi-analytic models and other various prescriptions that are trying to understand uh, radio emission due to vacation. So that's one of the things we'll also be working on um, in the future. Something that might also be interesting is understanding the merger histories of these radio galaxies to see whether mergers are actually a trigger for aging activity. This is um, a problem that's been 
um, thought to be the real uh, trigger for a long time, uh, though there have been studies that have shown they are and they are not. So that would be really interesting to see. Um, other studies that are being done on this is looking at the H1 and asymmetries of these uh, objects uh, that's being led by Martin Klovatsky, who is an IDEA uh, postdoc at UWC. Um, and then I'll finally end with this statement is that Simba opens a plethora of information and ideas that we can explore and really provides a cosmological and multi uh, context for studying radio galaxies, especially now in the era of the SKA. Uh, we were able to really see these um, fainter objects um, and see how they evolve over cosmic time. Um, and I will, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that um, Simba predicts or maybe considers that there is a type of unification theory. Uh, so specifically rather that AGN might just be an expected phase throughout the evolution of galaxies. Um, but I'll, I'll pretend that I did not really say that and uh, just end here uh, and open up for any questions. Uh, here are the relevant archive links if you want to see any more or if you want to um, understand anything more about specifically how we model radio galaxies, the Simba simulation, how um, black holes evolve with the galaxy, as well as the torque limit dedication model. Uh, and if you don't want to ask any questions here, you can feel free to email me or contact me outside. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole, for presenting this uh, exciting result, which showcased the capabilities of Simba. And uh, yes, now we are open to any questions from the uh, people who are attending. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or just uh, give your opinion, or you can also use the chat room. But in the meantime, oh, okay, uh, Richard, you can uh, go ahead. Hi, hi, Nicole. Um, hi, really, really nice talk. It, it's really exciting stuff to be able to integrate rate predictions for radio galaxies in simulations. So it's really nice. So I've got a philosophical question for you. Okay. To what extent are the results determined by the subgrid physics that you add, the rules, versus something that emerges from the simulations and are not particularly sensitive to the subgrid assumption? I know it's a hard question, but <laughs> I'm interested in your, your thoughts. So that is a hard question, but a very good question, because it is, of course, the resolution is one of the, the biggest issues with, especially with uh, understanding the growth of supermassive black holes, because at the end of the day with cosmological simulations, you can't really resolve the, um, the, um, the supermassive black hole, I guess, uh, or the event horizon of the supermassive black hole, because that is quite small. Uh, so I think there is a significant um, dependence on the fact that we cannot resolve that. I think there is um, a lot of the results might be due to that fact. Um, but what I can say is that although resolution might be a significant concern, um, starting off um, this sort of study and trying to understand this, I mean, we have to start from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a it's a good start into potentially um, and doing something that's perhaps more more high resolution. I know there are um, there will be a team that uh, does do high resolution simulations uh, specifically for Simba, uh, where we might see that uh, these results might be different. But that will that will definitely come at a at a later stage. Mm -hmm. For now, I think we um, we are safe to say that this is an estimation of what we expect to see mm -hmm. uh, with radio telescopes. Yeah, I think it's really good. And, and you, you've got to think, um, the first attempt I made at this was using semi-analytic models where we had one particle per galaxy. So, you know, it's, it's quite a step on from that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, who knows where we'll be in the next 
20 years with regards to, to simulation. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I, yeah. I think what you were saying is very, it's very important is, you know, that this idea, can we sort of build multi-scale simulations where we do simulations that are very high resolution? We can't run a whole cosmos like that, but maybe we okay. can work out, well, how do we then take that and encapsulate that at the resolution we can do? I think it's very exciting. Great yeah. moment to be doing astronomy. It is. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. OK, so we also have James. You can unmute and. Uh... Hi, Nicole. Thanks. Lots and lots Hi, James. of the process. Um, I wanted to ask you about the satellite fraction, given you name checked me briefly at that point. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, um, perhaps you said it, but do you see a different satellite fraction when you consider the Lurgs versus Hergs? And I was also wondering with that, if you looked at it as a function of halo mass, because um, in our work on X-ray AGM, which you, know, you might think of roughly like Hergs, it's very dependent on halo mass with a high satellite fraction of the most massive halos. For radio, you might expect something different, and you might even expect, you know, the lurgs to always be in the central in the highest mass halos, but hergs maybe are more often satellites. So I did check the fraction for for hergs and lurgs, and they are different, but very slightly. So the um, I just need to make sure I get this the right way around. So the hergs. So we have very few hergs in Simba as well, um, and the fraction that are satellites were I think um, 21%, Right. I might have this other way around. And then for the other population, so the Lurgs was 19%. Uh, so very small difference. Mm -hmm. um, and if I actually go back to this, um, this plot here, so I didn't do it as a function of halo mass, that might be something interesting to do as well. Um, so I did separate them into centrals and satellites as well, but it's very difficult to see in these parts. Um, but the the satellite, um, actually mostly lurks, the satellites are definitely in much uh, more dense environments than the centrals, uh, of course. Uh, but as you go to these really high masses, um, the centrals are typically um, in very high mass, um, sorry, high uh, density environments. Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting if you could take it in different bins of halo mass, because you might then start mm -hmm. to see, it would be interesting if you did then see more differences between the Herc and the Lurk population. Yeah, no, I agree, that would be quite interesting to do. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, we have Vanessa raising the hand too. Uh, hi, Michelle, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Nicole, sorry. Thanks for that uh, great talk. Okay. Um, I was going to ask, you know, you said you showed the plot where um, there was at low luminosities far less um, or far more overlap in the Herg and Lurg populations. Um, and you were saying that some of Imogen's results had started showing this. Um, can you give an indication of where on that luminosity um, access, um, you end up with the, the MITE survey? Oh, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not 100% certain this was something I actually need to double check with Imogen um, or actually double check with, with Catherine Hurl as well, because they, they definitely have um, the observations that overlap with the Simba um, luminosities as well, because we have provided them with um, some light cones to compare the, the flux densities. Um, they definitely have a lot more bright things, but I think they, um, they probe down to very low luminosities as well. I think I would even go as far as to say Basically, some of the lowest luminosities that Simba has might be included um, in the in the sample, um, but I'm not a hundred percent certain about that. Um, but definitely, Simba is, I would say, is contained within the in um, the luminosity distribution. Okay, know. and I guess this is also just the start of Mighty, right? They're going to yeah, probe exactly. much much so, deeper. 
exactly right. you know, they're, they're doing very exciting stuff and i'm um, really looking forward to to seeing what uh, comes out of mighty yeah brilliant thanks yeah we yeah. can still take one or two more questions thank you um, I have a quick question, Nicole. What are the main limitations of Simba? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that question? I think you just broke up a little bit. Yes, it's my connection. What are the main limitations of Simba? Um, like, in terms of specifically studying radio galaxies or just as a simulation? Uh, in um, terms of uh, studying radio galaxies, yeah. So for studying radio galaxies, I think, um, as Richard mentioned before, um, resolution is quite a quite an important factor with specifically studying the, the supermassive black holes at the center of these radio galaxies. Um, Another factor, which is again due to the resolution, is that when these black holes accrete, the accretion is very stochastic, which is why we have to um, um, average this over some time scale. Now, the reason why that might be problematic is because aging can be very variable. Um, so we are averaging out any sort of uh, variance within the accretion of these, um, these supermassive black holes. Um, another problem uh, might be, again, as I mentioned before, specifically how we um, model the, the jets of these AGNs. So for, for a simulation, it's quite difficult to really model these super high relativistic jets. So the maximum um, velocity of these jets are something like 7,000 kilometers a second. Um, and then also uh, the fact that we define them only starting at these low Eddington fractions, uh, which again, circles in with the idea of the stochasticity is, is also something we need to keep in mind. It might not be a problem just yet, but it, it is something important to keep in mind. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll stop there with mentioning all of Simba's problems. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I don't uh, see any question anymore from the chat, so may, I think we can uh, stop right here. Thanks again, Nicole, for agreeing to be a speaker of our weekly colloquium. And uh, thanks everyone that attended uh, this uh, session as well. Uh, we hope to see you again next week with uh, Eric Hogg, a new speaker, talking about Gaia. See you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Enjoy the Thank rest you. of your day. Bye. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. <sighs> Vanessa, uh, are you the one who is going to stop the recording or should I? I can stop it. Okay. <laughs>